Super. Thank you very much um, for the invitation to come and speak. Uh, this is my third time up here, so I must be doing something right. Um, so I'm a microbiologist and an infectious diseases consultant working here at, here at Bart's Health. Um, and this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about um, some interesting cases. So the aims of this afternoon are to try and keep you awake. It's nearing the end of the day. But also to present some cases from Bart's that I think highlight some important aspects of this meeting. So the first being the host pathogen interaction, which you'll hear more about tomorrow, um, and also the problems of antifungal resistance that you've heard about um, today. I guess the important thing to say now is, is, that, is, that this, um, is that by the end of this, you should be entertained by some good cases, and you should be reminded about how host immunity, or the lack thereof, um, can really impact on the clinical presentation of fungal infection. Now, this bit of the day doesn't really work without audience participation or without you responding to the questions. It's a bit like kind of pulling teeth if everyone's sitting quietly and not really interacting. What I'd rather it be is, is something like this. This looks a lot more fun um, than, than the previous slide. So let's try and uh, in, engage in this sort of level of, uh, of, of entertainment. Um, so moving on to this, uh, the first case, so 58-year-old man um, seen at Bart's Health um, in December of 2015, diagnosed with AML. He's treated with standard first-line chemotherapy. And slightly unsurprisingly, one week into his treatment, he's febrile, um, neutropenic with nasty mucositis, and he has an enterococcus thesium in his, in his blood cultures. Um, he's treated with vancomycin. Whether that's required or not is debatable. And the fevers abate. That's not that exciting. At week three, he's taken a while to recover his counts. He's still febrile. He's still neutropenic. Um, and this time, his blood culture has grown a candida tropicalis. The interesting thing about this is, is, that, is that we, use, we don't use mold active uh, antifungal prophylaxis. So he has been on fluconazole prophylaxis uh, during, his, during his chemotherapy. So this is a candida tropicalis uh, on the back of fluconazole prophylaxis. So the first question to get your thinking caps on is what would you do now? Would you remove his pick line? Would you? Send the candidate for sen sensitivity testing. Would you look in the back of his eyes? Would you get an echo? Would you repeat his cultures? Would you do all of the above? Or would you do something else? Fantastic. <laughs> so, 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 so I would probably do something else as well as doing all of the above. Um, does anyone want to shout out those who said something else? What would you like to do? Change his treatment. Exactly. I think he needs an antifungal. That's a very good point. So moving swiftly on to the next question. It is. He needs, a, he needs a different antifungal, perhaps. So here's the next question is, what antifungal would you do? Would you use? Would you use amphotericin? Would you use an echinocandin? Would you carry on his fluconazole? Would you switch to isaviconazole, voriconazole, do something else? Or you wouldn't do anything. You'd stop his antifungals. This is really not significant and, and just stop. Great. OK. That's interesting. So most people will switch them to an echinocandin. Some will switch to ambosome. Um, so what did we do? We switched him to Amazon, um, partly because he still had fevers. We had the candida. We weren't really sure what was going on. So we started Amazon. We did remove his pick. Um, interestingly, as is fairly typical, we grew nothing from his pick tip. Um, we did an echo of his valves, which was normal. We asked the eye guys to look in the back of his eyes. That was all normal. And repeated his blood cultures, which were all sterile. Um, happy days. End of story. He's fine wouldn't make a very good case, so he wasn't particularly fine. So he was just about to finish two weeks' worth of Amazon. He was better. His cancer had recovered. He was no longer neutropenic, but he starts to spike fevers again, and his repeat blood cultures are all, are all sterile, but unfortunately, at this point, he starts to develop blurred vision in his left eye. So this is a guy who's gone through induction chemotherapy for, for AML, has had one bacterial uh, infection, has had a candida tropicalis bloodstream infection, initially getting better on Amazon. Um, but now appears to be spiking fevers again. So um, pick up your pointers again. So what would you do now? Would you ask Liz Johnson what the results of the susceptibility testing were? Would you get even more cultures than you already have? Would you look in his eyes again? Would you get some imaging? Would you do all of the above or something else? Brilliant. I agree. Um, and in terms of those of you who said something else, what would you like to do? Change the therapy? OK, that's fine. So he's, he's, he's got a fever despite being on Amazon. Have we got something resistant? Should we change his treatment? That's a reasonable suggestion. So what did we do? Um, we checked his susceptibility results. Um, and we found that it was oh, wrong way around. There it is. So amphotericin was susceptible. It was fluconazole resistant, as perhaps was um, 
anticipated. It was voriconazole, voriconazole resistant, but only just of relevance later. Acarnacandins were very susceptible. Um, the fusagazine, sorry, I didn't write down the MIC when I made the, the talk, but it was, it was susceptible. So we, we've not got a failure of treatment on the basis of resistance. Um, we took lots of blood cultures. They were all negative. So we think he doesn't have a persistent candidemia, although we don't know because diagnostics aren't great. Um, and we did ask the eye guys to look in the back of his eyes. And what they said is this chap has a candida retinitis, not a candida endophthalmitis. And I guess the significance of that is that, is that because the retina has a good blood supply, we can probably get away with systemic antifungal therapy rather than sticking needles in his eye to give him individual therapy. Um, so he has a candida retinitis. Um, and we get some more imaging. Now, remember, this chap is a hematology patient. So what do you think is the first line imaging that this man gets? He gets a PET CT scan because he is a hematology patient. So he gets a PET CT. And this is what his PET CT shows. So as you can see, I should put a, a normal up. Um, so, the, so that's his liver. That's his spleen. They're not normal. They are full of essentially hot spots in his liver and his, and his spleen. You can see more in the, in, the, in the coronal section. Again, lots of spots in his liver and his spleen. The liver ones don't show up so well from here, but hopefully you can see that there's lots of patchy high uptake in both of those, both of those organs. So they show multiple avid lesions in his liver and his spleen. He's also got some calcified pulmonary nodes, possibly old TB. Other tests we did of interest, he had a very high ALP, alkaline phosphatase, having been normal before, and he had quite a high beta D glucan at 390. Um, and this is just an interesting set of uh, numbers. So this is, this is when he starts his chemotherapy, he becomes completely flat. This is when he has his enterococcal bacteremia, when he is neutropenic and has his mucositis. This is when his counts recover and when his fever begins and his alkaline phosphatase begins to, begins to rise. So just a, a nice kind of show of, of, of his blood test results. So there's no question behind this. What, can I have a shout out in terms of what, what do you think the diagnosis is? I think so, exactly, yes. I'm, he I'm hearing lots of correct answers. So yes, he has chronic disseminated candidiasis or hepat hepatosplenic candidiasis. So I'll come on to treating him later, but this is just an interesting kind of story. So, he, so we treat him. So he has a long course of voriconazole and flucytosine. So why did we choose vori and flucytosine? If you remember the agents that we had, we, the only oral agents we had to treat him were voriconazole and, and flucytosine. And we, we thought long and hard about it. Should we put him through a long course of OPAT um, antibiotics, or should we try and give him a decent high dose of voriconazole and see how he went? So we monitored things very closely. We checked his levels. Voriconazole was fine. He was therapeutic. And we kept a close eye on him, his beta-D glucan, and his imaging. And so over time, he continued to improve. His fever settled. Um, and at about four months into treatment, there is still a, sing well, a couple of spots in his spleen, but most of the spots in his liver have all, have all disappeared. So we stopped his treatment after six months on the basis of a negative beta-D glucan on a couple of readings and consistent improvement in his PET-CT. He had no recrudescence of his symptoms. But then, he needs an, uh, an, an elective cholecystectomy. He's got a, a, um, a, a gallstone. At operation, the surgeons see some nodules in his liver, and fairly sensibly, the surgeons say, let's take a chunk of that, um, and let's send it to the histopathologist. So they duly send the chunk of liver to the histopathologists, and this is what it shows. So I'm no histopathologist, but this is a chunk of liver. That's normal. That's not normal. On a slightly how, higher power, Essentially, this shows an area of, of necrosis surrounded by epithelioid macrophages. Um, and on, you can get a sense there's something in the middle of, of that granuloma, as it were. And on a Grocot stain, um, which I had slightly higher power, but you can see with the eye of faith, lots of cystic lesions um, and lots of things that look like, um, uh, look like yeast. So lots of yeast with, with possibly some pseudo hyphae kind of up here. So we find he has a granulomatous process in his liver in which we can see what look like fungal elements. What do we do now? So what would you do if you, if you had this, if you got the phone call, which I did from the hematology consultant to say, we've just got this told you about, what would you like to do? Would you retreat him? Would you rebiopsy him? Would you, would you do nothing? Or would you do something else? So voting now, please. Interesting, okay, that's a very interesting split from the audience. So, so a third would retreat, a third would, would try and get some more samples. Um, those of you who do something else, what would you do? What else would you do? 
Relook his pets? Okay, so rescan him, relook again. Have we, has something else kind of come up? No, exactly. Good point. Yes, so check it beta do you can. So we, we did nothing. We said, these are likely all dead fungi. He has, it, we actually did do other things. So we did repeat his beta do you can, and we did get a repeat pet, but essentially we did nothing. We didn't really restart his treatment. Um, so we thought this, these were all dead. Um, we didn't think that they all looked a bit beaten up. So we got used to seeing candida on a gram in a blood culture that looked big and juicy and healthy. They looked really weedy and very unhappy looking candidates. So we thought they were all non-viable. His beta deglucan was negative. So we said, do, do nothing. And to this day, as far as I know, he remains well. Um, so just a little bonus question. This, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't a, a question you need to vote for. But, but how did candida tropicalis get its name? Is, a good, is, a, is an interesting kind of question I posed to myself. Um, who knows? The tropics. The tropics, exactly. Does anyone know which tropics? No. So um, you've all walked past this. This, this, is, this is Hogarth's um, Jesus at the Pools of Bethesda. Candida tropicalis has absolutely nothing to do with this picture, but I thought I'd show it because Samir probably did earlier in the day. Um, you haven't. You haven't. It is, I know. I'm sorry. So, yes. So you can see the real thing. It's a huge mural on the staircase as you go outside. It is, it's, a, it's a fantastic mural, but unfortunately, it's got nothing to do with Candida tropicalis. So this one, so I didn't just show this for, for gratuitous um, bit of nudity. Who knows where this, where this fresco is from? Fantastic. So Siguria in, in, in Sri Lanka. So Aldo Castellani was a, was a Florentine-born uh, mycologist who spent some time in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and he first described Candida tropicalis while working in Sri Lanka. So you'll, work, you'll walk away from the two days remembering nothing, except that Candida tropicalis was named, in, named after him, him in Sri Lanka. So there you go. Um, a couple of slides about hepatosplenic candidiasis. So also known as chronic disseminated candidiasis, so as distinct from acute disseminated candidiasis. Um, it's almost always seen in patients who have got hematological malignancies who are recovering from an episode of neutropenia. And it's frequently associated with persistent fever, but not really associated with hemodynamic compromise or sepsis, in contrast to people who have got you know, acute candidemia. And the proposed pathophysiology is one of um, uh, candidemia leading to, uh, in the setting of mucositis because of chemotherapy. You then get dissemination of your candida and replication during periods of neutropenia. You then get immune recovery leading to immune recognition. And the clinical features are driven at least in part by, by a robust inflammatory response as opposed to um, ongoing unsolved uh, fungal infection. So in terms of in commensurate with that, the clinical features are often ones of, of fever and hepatic inflammation. The interesting thing is why hepatosplenic? Well, apart from candida auris, a lot of candida live in our gut. Um, and so the idea is you have a bit of leakage, you've got a bit of mucositis, you've got a heavy burden of candida within your um, portal system, so you get deposition of candida within your, within your, uh, within your liver and your spleen, and that's, that's why it's thought disease predominantly occurs there. Um, interestingly, investigations that point you in the right direction, one is the alkaline phosphatase, which is often raised. It's akin to seeing an alkaline, alkaline phosphatase in TB, where it represents a, a, a granulomatous process within the liver. Interestingly, only, only a third of patients will have a documented candidemia, but the assumption is that all of them will at some point have been candida. Um, would have been candidemic. Um, imaging will show you characteristic lesions within, within the liver, spleen, and sometimes the kidneys. And sensitivity on, on, on imaging, the, the alleged best is MRI followed by CT followed by ultrasound scan, but there's some data suggesting that, that PET CT is probably as good as, as good as MRI. Though I'm sure the hematologist, if they could, would probably get a PET MRI um, instead. So in terms of histology, the, the, the gold standard is, is, is histology, but often the biopsies are, are negative um, and don't show anything, largely because of the multiple but very small lesions, often lesions that are a centimetre or less, so it can be quite difficult to skewer them with, with a biopsy. We were lucky in terms of this guy had an open biopsy because he had a cholecystectomy, so they took a big chunk of his liver. Um, and actually, the appearances people have described in terms of biopsies vary depending on the illness. So if they're done very early in infection, you can get a more kind of pyogenic process as the, as the neutral is going to come back, but actually things then evolve into a granulomatous process. Um, and in terms of microbiology, biopsies of, of, the, of the liver are often negative, but beta d glucan is, is typically, if not, if not invariably, raised. And in terms of treatment, looking at the IDSA guidelines, they suggest giving induction therapy with, with an echinocandin for several weeks, followed by 
um, maintenance with an oral azole with a choice determined by interactions and resistance and, um, and toxicity and to treat for a long time, essentially, and it seems to be until symptoms resolve, imaging resolves, beta D-glucan gets better. But there is debate in a, in a, in a recent kind of letter to, um, to CID in response to, the, in response to the IDSA's kind of candidate guidelines saying, look, if the pathophysiology really is immune-mediated, do we really need to give six months' worth of treatment? Um, and I think that's an unanswered or unanswered question. And there's some good data suggesting that if people who are particularly troubled by the inflammatory manifestations of this disease, you can give adjunctive steroids to try and, to try and damp things down. Uh, so in summary, um, for this particular case, kind of clinical clues, think about um, disseminated candidiasis in patients who have been on treatment for acute leukemia, whose cancer have recovered, who have a prolonged fever, and think about them if they have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, and think about doing a beta D-glucan and some imaging. So, so an interesting case. I've got two more quick cases to go through that are similar but slightly different. So, so you have to keep your thinking hats on. So that's, that's disseminated uh, candidiasis. So let's go on to cases two and three. So case number two is a 33-year-old woman referred to um, us in the immunology clinic from the Eastman Dental Hospital because of recurrent oral candida. Does she have an immunodeficiency? And it turns out she also has vaginal candidiasis and cutaneous fungal infection which has been recurrent or persistent since childhood with temporary relief with antifungals. And there's a suggestion going through her family history of some other family members affected by, by fungal infection. Um, I think this is a slightly old version of my talk because I've got some fantastic pictures from, um, from the Eastman of her, of her mouth, which is in a terrible state. So hopefully those will go up onto the, onto the website, but it just shows her mouth kind of covered in, covered in candida. Um, and that was her mouth swab. Um, in, line with, in line with her previous treatment, she's developed some azole resistance along the way. Um, oh. So case number one, um, just having a bit of a think in terms of, I guess the predict to this is, do you think there's an immunodeficiency going on and what sort of tests would you like to see in someone who presents with, 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 this, with this sort of problem? Would you like a HbA1c, a HIV test, some lymphocyte subsets, some immunoglobulins? None of the above, this is just normal, you know, re recurrent candida happens or do you like all of the above and some more tests? So voting, please. Okay, very good, fine. Okay, so we like, we like all of these and, and a few more tests. It's always good to do more tests. So in terms of her immune workup, she was HIV negative, she wasn't diabetic, she had normal antibody levels in her serum, she had normal lymphocyte subsets and she had normal cytokine studies um, in terms of looking at um, you know, type one immune signaling. Um, she had a, a moderately low serum mannose binding lectin level, which you can debate it, its significance. Um, in this case, probably doesn't mean very much. Um, but she did initially have impaired T cell proliferation to candidal antigens, which we sent to Great Ormond Street. So not, not completely abrogated. So that was, that was the control in terms of proliferation from you know, tenfold multiplication of, of a number of her T cells. Um, but in this case, there's only a fourfold change in, in her case. So a suggestion that something's kind of going on. Um, case number three, so a 64-year-old man, a bit older this time, again referred from the Eastman Dental Hospital with recurrent oral candida, um, query immunodeficiency. And this poor chap, his mouth was in a terrible state. He had had multiple dysplastic and SCC lesions, thought to be because of chronic oral inflammation. Um, he had chronic um, fingernail onychomycosis um, and also recurrent staphylococcal folliculitis. Again, problems since childhood, and he's being referred at the age of 64 to ask if there's an immune problem going on. Um, again, short-lived response to antifungals. So, and, and his, he, he got fed up taking antifungals, so stopped taking them because they didn't really do very much, so that probably reflects his, his lack of faith in antifungals. Um, and his skin swab had, um, had grew staph aureus. So, really simple question. Do you think immunological investigations are justified in this case? Yes or no? This is probably the last question, so this is an easy one to finish on, I hope. Hopefully a not, not contentious question, but we'll see. <gasps> Not sure if 15% got the wrong button. I don't know, but but in terms of, it'd be interesting if, if if those of you who don't think it was warranted come and see me afterwards, and we can have a we can have a chat. To, <laughs> not not for, not for re-education, but just because I want to know kind of I want to know what you're thinking. So so that's fine. Um, so we'll see. So here's immune workup. He's interesting. So he's again HIV negative, not diabetic, nor, normal antibodies, normal lymphocyte subsets. He interestingly has got impaired IL-17 production um, in response to polyclonal T cell stimulation. Um, and we'll come on to IL-17 in a bit. And he also has high-level autoantibodies to IL-21. So IL-21 is important in um, immune signaling going down the, the, the T helper cell 17 pathway, which, which helps um, mucosal antibody, 
mucosal immune responses to candida and to staphylococci. So there's some suggestion that he has, again, some problem. So what do you think the underlying kind of diagnosis is in these two cases? What's that? Apicet and step one. In the, in the setting of what? Fine. So, so, uh, so, you think he, he, so you think he's got chronic mucoidinous candidiasis. That's fine, I hear you say, but this is just a descriptive term. What, I hear you ask, is the underlying problem with these two people. So, I mean, chronic mucoidinous candidiasis is a descriptive term. It just means they have chronic mucoidinous candidiasis. It's not, it's not particularly helpful. So, what, what the really interesting thing is, 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 is my colleague at the back. Yes, cytokine production? Exactly, yeah. Exactly. So I'm glad you asked. I'm glad I asked the question. So, so in both of these two cases, they both had, had uh, mutations in their STAT1 gene. Um, so I'm glad that's cleared that up. So you can all go away now, kind of go, well, I know all about that now. That's fine. So a little bit of a talk about chronic mucokinase candidiasis. What is it? What, what are the immune responses? We've heard about Apicet and Air1. We've heard about cytokines. So what is it? So chronic mucokinase candidiasis is a group of conditions where genetic mutations lead to immune impairment resulting in chronic, generally non-invasive candle infections of the skin and the nails and the mucous membranes. There are many mutations described, and there will be more to date. So um, one, in, one is, one is the, the AIR gene, there's STAT1, there's STAT3, there's CARD9, there's Dectin1, there's IL-17. The interesting thing about this is that genotype really does reflect or influence phenotype. And it, and it gives you a real insight into the mechanism of the normal immune response to candle. Uh, antigens and, and, and candida. So if you pick apart um, what the immune response is, um, and so depending on the defect, um, chronic mucoidinous candidiasis can be the only issue, or it can present with susceptibility to other infections, staphylococci, herpes viruses, uh, mycobacterial species. You can have autoimmune manifestations, most commonly in the air mutations, and other bits and pieces as well. So this is a really busy slide that I'll spend the next three hours going through. Um, now, this is just a, a schematic of the immune response to candida. Um, don't look at it very much, only to, only to look at the lots of arrows saying these are all the different mutations and all the different problems that have been described in people with chronic mucodinous candidiasis. And I think you can see lots of them. And the only one I'll talk about today very briefly is STAT1, because both of the patients that I presented have got mutations in their STAT1 gene. Um, but it's just going back just to give you an idea that the immune response to candida is complicated and lots of mutations have been described that impact on that. So talking a little bit about STAT1, so it's a sig signal transducer. Um, multiple mutations have been described, but most of them in either the DNA binding domain um, or the coil, coil region of the, of, of the receptor. Um, a mutation does impact on, on phenotype. Um, and essentially, what does, what does STAT1 do? What do the mutations do? So what's interesting is, is that there's a balance between, between STAT1 and STAT3, which are intracellular signaling kind of pathways that direct uh, naive T helper cells down different pathways into either kind of inflammatory T helper 1 phenotype or T helper 17 phenotypes or, you know, um, or TH2 phenotypes. So your, your intracellular signaling determines the path that your T cells follow. And the idea in this is, is that you get overactivity in STAT1. So your mutation is a gain of function mutation. So your STAT1 is overactive. So you get lots of STAT1 signal. You get lots of T cells going down the STAT1, TH1 sort of pathway. You get, very, you get fewer um, T cells going down the STAT3, IL17, TH17 sort of pathway. So you get a, a relative deficit of, of TH17, IL17 mediated signaling, uh, which is key to mucosal immune response to candida, which is why the disease manifests um, as it does. Coming back to kind of clinical life from, from, the, from the test tube, the real challenge is that these guys have a mutation that they will have for life. Only a very small proportion of people have successfully been, been transplanted, and that's in people with specific gene mutations that have often kind of catastrophic disease with multiple, multiple other things, and these are people who are transplanted in childhood. You wouldn't transplant either of the two cases I've shown you. They have inconvenient, annoying chronic candle infection, but not necessarily worthy of a, of a bone marrow transplant. And so, they often need, need long, if not kind of lifelong, antifungals. And with this, the acquisition of resistance is a problem kind of going on the resistance theme from, from the meeting. And so in terms of the study that was published in Blood recently, looking at um, this cohort, 40% become resistant to one agent, 10% become resistant to multiple agents. And the issue is trying to manage toxicity and, and, and interaction. So it can be a real challenge following these people up for, up for life. We, we got very helpful advice from, from, from Desa Lilich. 
um, up in Newcastle who has a cohort of people with, with chronic mucodentous candidiasis. And her approach is to give people three to six months of, of induction um, therapy, systemic antifungals, to try and reduce the burden of, of infection, and then to give them long-term suppressive therapy with either constant topical therapy or intermittent systemic therapy. Um, and what's interesting is people are starting to look at newer agents to see if, you can, see if we can try and um, alter the immune system in a way that um, skews it back towards the IL-17. So trying to um, give colony stimulating factors to try and push things towards the TH17 differentiation, or to use things like ruxolitinib, which, which is a JAK1-2 inhibition, to try and push things away from, from, the, from, from the STAT1 signaling that's the problem in people who have got gain-of-function STAT1 mutations. So, just to wrap things up, um, hopefully what I've um, explained to you is, is, is that candida is a ubiquitous human pathogen. Invasive candidiasis is often associated with defects in mucosal integrity, often problematic problems with granulocyte number and function, um, and often, as we've seen in the first case, with disease manifestations driven by immune recovery as opposed to by immune deficiency, whereas mucocutaneous candidiasis, on the other hand, is, is associated with disorders of T, T lymphocytes, so we've seen that in people who've got steroids, people with HIV, um, severe combined immunodeficiency, and then this really interesting cohort of people who've got chronic mucotinous candidiasis. Um, and from, with both of these disease phenotypes, resistance is a real problem in terms of trying to um, decide on therapeutic options and chance of success. So um, these are my aims. These were learning, learning objections, objectives for all of your portfolios and CPD points, so you can copy and paste these directly into, into there. So hopefully you've been entertained and shown some interesting cases, and hopefully you've been reminded how host immunity or or lack thereof is a, is, is a real problem. So thank you again for the invitation to speak. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm happy to have, have any questions now or, to, or, or afterwards, so thank you.